We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. July 20th in 1969, the day that humankind achieved what is in this humble historian's opinion the greatest feat in our shared history. Four days earlier, on the 16th, three of the bravest explorers the world has ever known stepped into their chariot and broke free the bonds of our atmosphere with the intended goal of stepping foot on another celestial body. Their success brought the name Apollo to the modern lexicon of human history as a term of exploration, bravery, and human ingenuity. In all, 12 men would walk on the moon from 1969 to 1972, their achievement being the culmination of decades of research and competition between the two major powers, those being the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. And the act of landing on the moon would cement American and Western dominance in the space race. I know that statement is a little controversial. However, it is true. The United States achieved what was thought merely a decade before to be an impossibility by many and the USSR failed in this goal. And yes, the USSR did genuinely try to get to the moon. We'll get to the N1 rocket eventually. Although it does look amazing, I will say that. But in saying that, losing the space race to Apollo should not be considered an insult, nor should it be laughed at. The USSR made incredible advances in space travel and rocketry, and gave us accomplishments such as the first man in space, the first satellite, and the first space station. Moreover, the root cause of the Soviets losing the space race is in the limited computing power of Soviet electronics. And while it doesn't exactly help when your best rocket designer, likely better than even Von Braun, died because he got thrown into the gulag on trumped up charges. Go Stalin. I've been wanting to make this video for a while, a history of the race highlighting the heroes of humanity who boldly went where nobody had gone before expanding our knowledge and our reach into the stars for, at least what the scientists were trying to achieve, the betterment of mankind. How these scientists and explorers used whatever resources they could get to get funding to do great things for humanity and achievements that humans could never dream of not even 20 to 30 years earlier. No matter, in some cases, with the likes of Von Braun, the cost. And finally, with the backdrop of the Cold War, an ideological hate how the two great space agencies of the era put enmity aside and came together to make space a fair ground again for the betterment of mankind with Apollo Soyuz. And lastly, I want this series to stem as a bit of a warning about how certain powers do not see the benefit in keeping space clear of our conflicts here on Earth. A couple of things though first, I, I started it after the last video, so the introduction to having a patron was a little rushed at the start of the Lissa video, but yes, I have started one. I've added the link to my channel and I thank all those who have joined and anyone who does. I'll also include a Discord link. I intend to cover topics in the future when I start this full time in less than, well, I'm recording this on the 1st of Feb and on the 29th it'll be my full time job. I intend to cover topics that are going to get me demonetized, that are going to be hard to listen to, that are going to be hard to hear, but they are important. So for those who do support me on Patreon, thank you so much. And those who are channel members, thank you as well.
The space race truly began before the Second World War. Its origins being experimental liquid fueled rockets in the United States, the Soviet Union, and Nazi Germany, and around the world. However, it's predominantly these three countries that get us going. But to break through the Kármán line and reach what is considered space, one would require far more powerful rockets and guidance. One of the earliest rockets to reach what we would consider space was the Aggregat 4. You may know it as the V-2, a Nazi Wunderwaffe or Wonder Weapon launched on the 20th of June 1944 and that reached an altitude of 175 kilometers before slamming back into Earth. A tool of destruction designed to bring terror and built on the back of slave labor, the future of this new world did not start off very bright. Following the war, both the United States and the USSR would take ownership of captured Nazi rockets and would offer incentives to captured scientists to join their respective sides. Sometimes these incentives were money and safety, and sometimes the others were sharper and more barbed wiry and gulaggy. Make no mistake though, the idea that the Nazi scientists are the only reasons humans went to space is just that, a myth. It detracts from the great minds such as Serhii Korolev and the absolute nutcases who make up Lockheed Martin's skunk works, and other forms of Lockheed Martin, and really just the absolute nutcases that make up all US rocketry and space plane designs in general. How else can you explain the SR-71, the U-2 or the X-15? The kicker though, that really got the race started, can be said to have begun at Los Alamos at 5.29am on the 16th of July 1945. The realisation that nuclear warfare was not just a possibility anymore, but a reality, meant that each side, in their burgeoning race to gain the upper hand, would need to find a way to get warheads on foreheads. Well, cities, not foreheads, but you get the idea. Faster than their enemies. And bombers were just a bit too slow to get this done, even when the US went and designed the Valkyrie, the coolest bomber ever made. It still was not fast enough. It takes time to get a bomber fueled and in the air, and as a second strike option, a second strike being, you've hit me, I'm completely gone, but you're not getting away with it, so you better not even think about it. Bombers just did not fit this bill, and they took too long. They just were far too slow. So focus shifted to those missiles captured from the Germans, and those scientists who were asking for funding to pursue spaceflight started to be listened to, because for the powers that be, they were the best chance at getting their nuclear weapons into the enemy cities. The Soviet Union first started developing artillery-based rockets in 1921, following the establishment of a small research laboratory known as the Gas Dynamics Lab in English. The idea was that this lab would begin to explore the possibility of solid fuel rockets. The first test would begin in 1928 and further development would continue through the minds of Serhii Korolev, Friedrich Zander, Leonid Duskin and Mikhail Tikhonorov, with the first liquid fueled rocket launching in 1933. After the successful test, the design bureaus in the USSR were streamlined into the Combined Reactives Scientific Research Institute. Yeah, they like their names, don't they? <laughs> and the RP-318, the first rocket-powered aircraft, was built. Shortly thereafter, the team managed to bring out the RS-82 and the RS-132 missiles. You may have heard of them. They are the artist formerly known as Katyusha. The Soviets' progress in rocketry was truly astounding, and in many ways they were comparable to the progress of Nazi Germany. However, this is the Soviet Union in the 1930s. You all know what's coming next, it's Stalin time. The Great Purge from 1936 to 1938 didn't just severely damage the Soviet rocket industry and study, it damn near killed it. Anamark, he pointed this out in his video that he released the other day because he finally, you know, released his video on the, uh, on the Soviet fighter jets as after we all badgered him to do it for months. Uh, fantastic video, watch the whole thing, but he touches at one point about how Soviet aviation was almost cut off at the legs by the Great Purge. It, it's a brutal, brutal thing from a 
progress point of view, not just a humanitarian point of view, what the purge achieved in the Soviet Union. It effectively went, hey, you're working amazingly, you're building these incredible things, and now you're back to basically nothing. You're back to doing essentially whatever the party told you to do. Maybe you'll get a chance to study in a prison, but you better not, you know, step out of line or you're just going to get shot. The, the Great Purge did so much damage to human betterment and human technological development. It is genuinely insane to even, and that's before you even get into the horrificness of it for the average person. There's a reason why people like Silkortsi, for example, lived in the US. It's not just a case of, well, there's better opportunities here. It's a case of, there's no red terror. There's no purge. There's no death if I say the wrong thing about the dear leader in charge. It's, in many ways, something we're going to see a bit more of going forward. But in the aftermath of the Great Patriotic War, just Soviet word for the Second World War, several captured V2 rocket production facilities and the services of some of the captured scientists and engineers related to Von Braun's project were assembled into a production team and a Soviet copy of the rocket was produced under the now free Korolev, who'd gotten out of the Gulag, called the R1. The R1 entered service with the Soviet army on the 28th of November, 1950. Valentin Glushko and Korolev would then begrudgingly, because they really did not like each other, work together with the captured German scientists on its successor, the R2, which had a new engine designed by Glushko and a slightly longer body. The R2 would have twice the range, and in time, the R5 per beta would be developed. And this is where things start to get really interesting. The R5 was the world's first real ballistic missile. With its range of over a thousand kilometers and being able to carry a one megaton thermonuclear warhead, 1955 signaled for the very first time the year that the Soviet Union could strike deep into Europe with nuclear missiles and weapons. Scientific testing, of course, would continue with the early R series. There were flights with dogs and other payloads, but the big project, beginning in 1953 and finally flying after the R5, was the R7 Semyorka. And this rocket would truly change everything. Upside, it's also one of the coolest looking rockets you will ever see. The R7 flew on the 21st of August 1957, a distance of 6,000 kilometers, becoming the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile. Two months later, the R7, repurposed from her intended role as a missile, launched the first artificial satellite into orbit. Sputnik. The race was on. Now, unlike the Soviet Union, the United States' entry into the race wasn't just slow, it was almost non-existent. In 1914, the highly talented pioneer Robert H. Goddard developed and patented small liquid fuel rockets. But, after a hit job by some journalist at the New York Times, he became a recluse. You know, I'm not going to say it, my opinion on corporate journalism is well known. The United States, therefore, was one of the only major powers in the world to not have a rocket program on the eve of World War II. In fact, it would not be until after Operation Paperclip and the expatriation of German scientists and equipment to the US that would actually start to take rocketry and spaceflight seriously. Key win to America was the defection of Werner von Braun to the US side, because let's face it, if you had to surrender in 1945, which side are you picking to hand yourself over to? You can either get in the hole, or you can live in a nice mansion. Hole, mansion, hole, man. It's not difficult. It's a pretty easy choice why Von Braun went to where he went. Von Braun and a team of engineers and scientists, both American and German, got to work in New Mexico on the Hermes program. And on the 24th of October 1946, a modified V2 rocket, assembled by the team in General Electric, reached an apogee of 105 kilometers and it captured the first ever image of our Earth from above the Kármán line, the first photo of our planet in space. Shortly thereafter, in 1949, the team would launch the small sounding rocket known as WAC Corporal V2, the world's first ever multi-stage rocket. Moving on, the team set up in Huntsville, Alabama, at the US Army's Redstone Arsenal in 1950, and a few short years later, 
the Redstone rocket was launched. The Americans in this very, very short period, admittedly assisted by Stalin throwing Korolev in the Gulag and then half-hitching as many German experts as possible, had caught up. The space race is really a story of personalities. One of the most important personalities in the space race is Serhii Korolev. In 1955, when President Eisenhower's administration announced that it was the goal of the United States to launch small satellites into Earth's orbit by the 31st of December 1958, the Soviets, well, they wanted to win. They wanted to do that first. Shortly thereafter, at a function, a Soviet scientist would state that the USSR was intending on launching a satellite into space in the near future. Now, Korolev, born in Chitoymir, Ukraine, to a Ukrainian mother and a Belarusian and Russian father, in many ways is the true father of the Soviet space program. And I really hope in future, personally, that his name is put next to Von Braun in the collective knowledge for contributions to human spaceflight. The things Korolev achieved and the hell he went through to achieve them really do merit note. Korolev was an incredibly smart man, adept to understanding, particularly after his stint in the Gulag on trumped up charges, just how to get things done within the Soviet system. And in 1955, Korolev managed to get the Soviet Academy of Sciences on side with a commission to beat the Americans to orbit. Many point to this as the true start to the space race, as the Council of Ministers of the Soviet Union would now begin to treat spaceflight as a top secret priority and a high priority. I myself would argue the space race begins back in the early 1900s with the competing powers working between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union and then the space race develops in future between the Soviet Union and the United States, but that's my argument. A lot of other arguments say it begins here. Now, TASS... Yes, that task, the propaganda agency pretending that it's a news source, was ordered by the Politburo to create precedents on what to tell the public. The people would never know where, when, or why, or even how things were launched. Just that they were launched. It was all designed to be about as clear as mud. Secrecy in the Soviet space program is genuinely hard to fathom, just the level of it. In contrast to the US, for example, where the Mercury program astronauts such as Shepard were national heroes before they even launched into space. Soviet cosmonaut names would not be released until after they flew, details or missions themselves after they flew, and they were really few and far between even if they came out at all in terms of what they were actually doing. This is what sort of has given birth to the myth that the Soviets sent more people to space first before Gagarin, who just died, it, and the conspiracy theories behind it, but it, it's because of this level of secrecy. It's so much so to the point where the average Soviet citizen could probably tell you more about NASA than they could their own space agency during this period. In 1956, Korolev found that von Braun had tested a Jupiter-C rocket, and it had been a failure. Korolev, though, did think that this was an attempt at launching the first satellite into orbit, and knowing that his R-7 rocket was by far more powerful than any of the US launch vehicles, he put all his efforts into designing something called Object D as a primary satellite. Object D would be a proper satellite with cameras, scientific equipment, and it weigh about 1,400 kilograms, all the works, essentially, that you put into a satellite for the time period. But it was taking too long. In a rush to beat the Americans to orbit, Korolev contacted the Council of Ministers and proceeded to ask whether or not he could try something a bit simpler to get there first. And with that permission and consent, he built PS-1, a smaller, simpler satellite that only weighed 83.8 kilograms and held a simple radio transmitter and a couple of other bit of scientific tools. And thus, Sputnik was born. And for 22 days, the Soviet Union would cheer their propaganda victory, as the beeps from that little satellite could be heard around the globe, and it would spark a genuine panic in the Western world. The concern went so far as calling it a major defeat, and journalists, known for their level-headed takes at the best of times, called it a case of the Soviet Union conquering space. This was worsened when Project Vanguard failed its launch in 1957, and the press, being the press, dubbed it Flopnik or Staputnik. The Soviets went so far as to offer the US help under their program of assistance to backwards nations. Now, I rag on the Soviets a bit for some of the stupid things they've done, but that's absolutely hilarious 
especially when you consider that half the Soviet Union still in the 90s is using outdoor bathrooms. But we digress. Privately, the US went to Von Braun and his team working on Redstone and told him to speed the hell up. On the 31st of January 1958, barely four months on from Sputnik, a Juno 1 rocket launched from Cape Canaveral, and on board was Explorer 1. The Soviets may have been first, but it was time for the US to step up to the plate, and in 1958, Eisenhower created NASA, transferring the Army's space-related program to the Civilian Administration and naming Werner von Braun as the director of the newly renamed George C. Marshall Flight Center. Von Braun's dream of greater rockets with immense payloads would now receive support, and quietly, the US would start designing what would be known as the Saturn rocket family. In 1957, the Soviets would also achieve the feat of the first mammal in space with the dog Laika, a smart pooch found on the streets of Moscow, loaded into Sputnik 2 and launched into low orbit. Slight issue with that though, there wasn't any deorbiting technology at the time, and although Laika was sent on a one-way trip and would die in space, the state would claim that this was all planned and she was euthanized beforehand. While it was accepted in the Soviet lexicon that she would die in space, they didn't really care how, as long as they could prove a mammal could live in space. And truth be told, the average Soviet citizen and people in general around the world were not too impressed with the idea of grabbing a dog off the street and murdering it by throwing it into space. There would be a back and forth of achievements from here, with the US launching the first solar-powered satellite in 1958, the Soviets then achieving the first lunar flyby in 1959, Later in 1959, the United States would achieve the first satellite in polar orbit, and the first photograph of Earth from orbit. The Soviets in turn would achieve the first hard landing, aka okay, crash, on the moon by the Lunar 2 probe, and shortly thereafter that, the first photograph of the far side of the moon from Lunar 3. All these events and more continuing back and forward until the big moments in 1961. Human spaceflight. But that is for part two. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you've enjoyed my little start on the space race, please do like, comment, and subscribe. Discord link and Patreon link in the bio. But let me know what you think, and if you would like this little series on the space race to continue. Cheers.